There is a place where we can say that Jesus revealed the most of his humanity. This was a place where Jesus anguished, worried, and perhaps with the desire to feel God's support and support from his disciples, he raised up a prayer with tremendous feeling. This place tells us that affliction, pain, suffering will always be part of our lives, but we must also have a spiritual element with which to handle these situations. I invite you to join us in this place and allow God to teach you and speak to you here in this place. Good morning, I am Pastor Carlos Rios, and this is our devotional mana, a daily adventure with God. Today we are talking about another moment in Israel, and we are going to a place that is very significant, the Garden of Hetzemani. This was a very familiar place where the Lord had often retreated with his disciples here. But in this passage that we will be reading today is the last time in the scene, the last time Jesus appears here in this place, both at the Mount of Olives and Hetzemani indicate that the hours that were to follow the Lord, he would be facing great pressure and great affliction in his soul. In Mark chapter 14, verse 32, Jesus says to his disciple, Sit here as I pray. Jesus left eight of his disciples at the entrance of the garden and went with Peter, John, and James into the garden. Remember that these three disciples were the same that we spoke of yesterday. They had been witnesses at the Mount of Transfiguration, and now they see their Lord in great anguish. When it says in Matthew 36, 37, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And so join me in this Matthew 26 and read with me verses 38 on. Look at what scripture says. Matthew 26, 38 begins with saying, Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Luke tells us that the Lord went away from them at a distance about a stone throws away, a stone throw away, falling to his knees to pray. While Matthew and Mark tells us that he bowed on his face, that he bowed to the ground, and evidently he was not very far from the other disciples because they could see him and hear him, but he wanted to be alone with his father. And the disciples saw what he was doing. Look, the Bible says, and I would like to compare such a significant moment in the life of Jesus, because today Jesus will be teaching us a great lesson in regard to prayer. And so let's see why Jesus arrived here to the Mount of Olives, and let's also see the content of his prayer, because we should not become accustomed to just one type of prayer. I've mentioned to you before that praying is not just to ask. It is not about providing a shopping list to tell God what I need. No, to pray is to speak with God. To pray means to have communion with the Father. And above all, there is something transcendental in prayer that Jesus teaches us here in Hetzemani. Let's look at what Jesus did. He went with all of his disciples. He left several in one place, and then with three of them, he went inside the Garden of Hetzemani. Here the Bible says that he went to pray to the Father, but his disciples saw him very anguished, troubled, because Jesus knew that what was ahead for him was very difficult, very terrible. The scene of Jesus now knowing what would happen with his life. And in this scene, when he begins to pray to God, it reminds me of the scene in Genesis. Do you recall when the Lord said to Abraham, Go up to the Mount of Moriah and offer your son in sacrifice. And the Bible says that effectively Abraham took the firewood and the knife, the fire and everything he needed, including his son, and left for the Mount 
But it also says that he told the servants that were with him, Abraham said to them, wait for me here with the mule and the boy and I will go up to pray and will be and we will return to you. And also remember the moving conversation that the father and the son had as they went up to the top of the mountain to the point where Isaac asked his father that he why did he not see the lamb that they were to sacrifice he had often come to this place with his father but the difference was that this time he did not see the lamb that was to be sacrificed to which Abraham replies well, God will provide. And I believe these two moments are very parallel because it is a similar experience to what the Son of God and the Father felt in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because here, Jesus is pouring out his soul, knowing that he is going to die. And the Bible says that he prayed to the Father while he was very close to his disciples, very close to the Father. And this should lead us to consider that we must be very close to the Father when we pray to Him. Jesus was in great agony, in great torment. In fact, this Matthew 26 that we are reading, in verse 39, it says that He prayed three times. And the three times He prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And so look at how interesting. Only the evangelist Luke tells us that an angel appeared from heaven to strengthen him in Luke 22 43 only he writes of the agony and this traumatic situation that the Lord was living and so pay close attention to this Luke makes reference that this moment was so dramatic so difficult that his sweat was as drops of blood falling to the ground Jesus knew that he was to take upon his body all the sins of the world, that he was to die and to take with him the evil of mankind. This is why his prayer here in Gethsemane reveals to us how he kneels in front of the Father in this moment. And notice that there are two verses that tell us about this event that Jesus is facing. Hebrews 5, 7 says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions and fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. When this moment came, he knew that he was facing a great battle. And Luke 22:45 says that when he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. And so let's look at this contrast because there is a great contrast here. But why? Because we see Jesus and he was anguished. And Jesus' anguish led him to kneel. And as he prayed, did he say to God, remove this cross from me? No. He said, Lord, I want you to teach me to do your will. Do not remove anything from me, but I want to be sure that I am doing your will and so do you see what the secret of true prayer is the secret of true prayer when we approach God is to be willing to do his will through prayer the Bible says this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask for something according to his will he listens to us and so do you know what is the secret for God to listen to our prayer the secret is that it has to be made according to His will. God cannot simply just continuously listen, listen to our prayers if they are one-sided and selfish. James there in chapter 4 says, You ask, but you ask wrongly, because you ask for your desires, for your passions. And so, my dear family, this prayer in Gethsemane is that of a man that is in great anguish Jesus knows that he is going to die but he says Lord I am willing to do your will so I ask how many of us are willing to kneel and seek God's will even if we do not like what is going to happen with our lives and so do you see this is when 
prayer is no longer pretty or nice because the truth is that we often like to pray to God asking for things. We often like to pray just to feel that God is blessing us to feel His presence. But very few times does our prayer adjust to God's plan where we ask, Lord, what is your will? Lord, what do you want with this moment at this time? I've mentioned to you before that in my time as a pastor, I've learned to pray because often we are very emotional when we pray. For example, what is the most emotional thing we can do when we see that someone, when we meet with someone who is sick? Well, we immediately pray for this person to be healed. But sometimes it is not God's will to heal someone. Sometimes God's will is to glorify himself in that sickness, in that illness. Perhaps because this illness, this sickness will become a source of blessing for that person, for that family, eventually. And so God will use this circumstance. How many of us, when we pray for a loved one, the last thing we'll ask is for him, to, for God to take him to his presence? Because, of course, we want that person for us. We want that person to live with us. And sometimes, for example, we have a parent that is 90 or 95 years old, and we continue to pray for God to heal your, that parent and not for that parent to go to God's presence. But what God designates in his will will often be difficult to understand for us. In fact, most times, because the Bible says that our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And so, in such a crucial prayer, Jesus taught his disciples so look at both sides of the coin. Jesus knew at that in this moment of anguish, this trialing situation that he was living in his soul, he was to kneel in order for his soul to be strengthened. But in contrast, look at what his disciples did. They were filled with sleep. And this is the problem that we have today. I believe that this scene in Hetzemani is the same scene we have day by day because often we are filled with problems with needs our souls are bogged down with anxiety with worry but instead of praying instead of these problems generating in us a spirit of going to kneel and to pour out our souls what do we do we fall asleep psychologists call this evasive sleep we sleep but we do not rest we sleep simply to close our eyes and think that the problems outside no longer exist. So it is not even a repairing sleep, which is the sleep that God gives us when we learn to trust and to rest in Him. And so let's look at this scene in Hetzemani this morning as we listen to this topic. And let's look at what Jesus did in this moment of anguish and what the disciples ended, ended up doing. And perhaps this will teach us something, my dear family. What does it teach us? That perhaps just as the disciples, our eyes are also loaded with sleep. Once again, notice that Jesus prayed three times. He prayed however long it took for him to feel strengthened. And so what must we understand by spiritual battle? There are people who exaggerate when they talk about this topic of spiritual battle and they take out a sword and say that they're going to fight against the devil and they're going to apprehend him and tie him and all kinds of things but truly when someone speaks to me about spiritual battle a spiritual fight i say well what more of a fight of a battle than to fight against our own sleep fighting with the resistance of our laziness fighting against our indifference because this is the truth the truth is that sometimes it's hard for us to spend time in prayer we go to time of praise at the church and we are like old cars that have to be pushed until they turn on and after 30 minutes we're finally raising our hands in prayer but at the beginning it's difficult for us to pray it's hard for us to concentrate to kneel and to be in God's presence. 
And why? For one simple reason, we are not accustomed to praying. And for example, I've always made this comparison. I would love to go to an opera, but I cannot imagine myself, a person like me who knows nothing about opera, for an hour and a half in a concert where I do not understand what is going on, perhaps looking around, looking at my surroundings and perhaps people who are in awe or even crying, people who are in, who are fully concentrated in the show. Well, I'm simply just looking around because I do not understand nor really enjoy what I am listening to or seeing. But why? Because I was never taught to understand, to listen, and to interpret what is going on here. But with this example, allow me to tell you that there is a grand majority, and this is ironic. What I'm going to say is ironic that there is a grand majority of Christians that during a time of praise or a time of prayer, it is as if they were in an opera that they do not understand. We open up our eyes and look around and ask, why is this person crying? Why is that person jumping up and down or so emotional? Because perhaps it is as if we are not connected. But the reason is very simple. And we are learning it here in the scene of Gethsemane. Jesus, a man who prayed, a man who sought God, he knew, he knew that there was no better path than to go to God's presence, to remain long times in God's presence. And we see it. Jesus got up strengthened, and with power he said to his disciples, Okay, my time is here. Let's go. While in turn, the disciples were tired, asleep, sleepy. My dear family, us here in Colombia are facing a critical moment. How will, will we be governed? I do not know, but do you know what I believe is that we often do not pray enough. It's not who does the most campaigning or who is more popular or the party that the person belongs to and who is going to win. No, truly, far from thinking of just the candidates, I continue to think about Colombia. I continue to think about this country, its inhabitants, its biblical principles. Any presidential candidate can change our destiny from one day to the other. As we've seen before, as is, has, has happened often, if we do not pray, because us as Christians have a great responsibility, and I do not want the same thing to happen to us as what happened to these disciples. A nation in a time of anguish, a nation in a key moment when us as Christians must kneel to pray and to have mercy over our country. But no, although we know the situation and many say that they are worried and anguished, but if we were so worried and anguished, we should be praying, fasting. This should be a key week for us Christians to join together to pray. The economy around the world is not easy. Look at the indicators and what they show us. There's so many things occurring around us. But I ask, instead of worrying, why do we not pray? Let's pray instead of worrying. Look at the situation with our youth, our children, all the things going on in the world. But the question is, are we praying? Father, thank you for this morning. I believe that this scene here is very clear, and we do not need much to understand it. On one hand, there is Jesus praying, crying out to his Father, praying as long as it is necessary for his heart to be filled with strength, ready to do God's will. On the other hand, the disciples are there, asleep, knowing the situation, feeling anguished and sorrowful, but they're there, sleeping. Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us to understand that there is a great need to approach you, that there is a great need to kneel, to pray for the situations, to pray for our children, for our family, for our nation. 
for all these pressing matters because truly the only thing that could make a difference is prayer because prayer reaches God's heart. May God bless you this morning. May God fill you with his Holy Spirit and may he make you a man, a woman of prayer. Lord, thank you for each listener of Mana. May your blessing rest upon each one. We give you this day. We give you our activities. Cover us with your blood and keep us from evil. In Christ Jesus, amen and amen. My dear family, those who God will give us the blessing and the privilege to will go up to the Holy Land, we will visit this place in the same place where Jesus kneeled and we will pray here. We will pray a prayer that changes our condition. If you want to join us in Jerusalem, pray and ask God to give you the means because I know he can do it. I wait for you tomorrow. Blessings to all.